Hello, and welcome to the inaugural episode of Mercy Walks with Migrants. My name is Mike Poulin, and I'm a member of the Mercy Justice Team. Joining me today is Sister Ann Connolly, a Sister of Mercy who spent six years working on behalf of migrants. From 2015 to 2021, Sister Ann lived in a mobile home park in Texas, just a 15-minute drive to the U.S.-Mexico border near Brownsville and Matamoros. She currently lives and works in Philadelphia. Welcome, Sister Ann. Thanks, Mike. Good to be here with you and with everyone who's listening. So can you want to tell us, give us a little background on how we ended up uh, coming today to be talking about immigrants? Sure. And thanks for the good question. You know, we have that wonderful immigration advocacy group. We call it the IAG. It's made up of probably at least 20 Sisters of Mercy and other Mercy associate people uh, sprinkled all over the country, kind of going from the uh, California, San Diego, Tijuana border, all the way to Portland, Maine. Um, sisters who have been in other parts of the world, South America, Central America, greatly. Sisters now sprinkled across the country, accompanying people at bus stations, detention centers, in a myriad of ways. Kathleen Erickson is one of those sisters that we hope to hear from soon as well. And she told us years ago, she reminded us 15 years ago, the border is in every city in this country. These sisters and I are passionate about telling the truth for migrants, raising the consciousness of all of us so that we can be in solidarity with them in the best way possible. And this advocacy group, um, we meet on a monthly basis. And I just remember it was uh, probably last spring when we were together, it was just one story after another that people were sharing about their work. And kind of as a group, we kind of thought, how do we share these stories so that other people hear about not only the good work that Mercy is doing on behalf of immigrants, but also to hear about the trials and the tribulations that immigrants uh, encounter as they're coming to this country or trying to come to this country or have been living here. And so we thought it would be great to to do some interviews uh, with sisters about their work around immigration so we can uh, share these stories with a wider audience. So as we as we kind of get started, can you tell us, Sister Anne, what was your focus while you were living and working uh, near the border? Yeah. <clears throat> I uh, The first thing that I think when I hear you ask that question is, it's a difference from my focus. That's not exactly where we go as Sisters of Mercy. And I'll explain that. But the question makes me really aware of what I've learned from Catherine McCauley and also from association with Miranol Sisters through many years in South America. And that is that <laughs> When we go to a new, when we go someplace new, we try not to go there with our agenda, knowing what we're going to do, but rather we learn what people need, what the moment presents. And that was certainly the case for me in the border area, the southern border with Texas and Mexico. Truly, the, there are very immediate daily needs for people. We hear about some of it in the nightly news. Folks arrive needing some clothing, needing a good hot meal, needing a shower. Some of the people that settle in the area need continual visits, help to find out where the grocery store is, where the public transportation is, help to get their driver's license. I had the 
wonderful experience of being involved in a lot of those things with people, getting people to the airport. The people who are lucky enough to move on from the border have to have a destination somewhere in the country, someone who will receive them. Many people needing to get to the hospital. Medical care, moms delivering a baby, medical care for a newborn. There's one more thing that happened with my focus while I was at the border, apart from the immediate boots on the ground, things that people needed. And that was the mercy connection that happened. My experience was from east to west, north to south in this country, there were so many of us who wanted to do something about the mess at the border and the mess that continues at the border. Continually to receive notes saying, please and thank you for being my hands and feet. I experienced an accompaniment of myself as well as migrants during the time being with migrants at the border. It sounds like there uh, was a lot to focus on, uh, a lot of needs to meet. Could you share with us a story that stands out in your memory and speaks to your work uh, with the, to the plight of immigrants? So it's really hard to find one story we don't have to do just one. We could do more than one. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> the stories abound, of course. And uh, it's funny, one of the last things I was thinking just this morning, I could tell lots of stories. How many times a mom or a dad now ready to move on to their destination, wanting to have a contact address that was would be saved for when they got to a point of being able to, as we say, pay it forward. I always loved those instances. It was so, so human. We all want to help somebody else. It's not only about us helping these people. They have their return. Um, the crowds in the centers that house the migrants I have a friend who goes back and forth still, and he reminded me recently, and his words are true. Often, there's so many people using that center that evening or that afternoon, and the quiet calls your attention. There's so many babies, and the quiet calls your attention. They're not crying. And my friend used the word safe how safe they feel. That's what we can offer to people. Now there is one story. This is something that I never want to forget. And so much so I, I wrote this down some years ago. I call it a follow up to a tender moment. This story is about a little girl with her dad among lots of children and dads on a very busy afternoon at the center where I was working, where numbers had gone from 300 to 600. We hit 1,000 many days before we were done. And this day, I found all of a sudden a child wrapped around my knees, looked up, saw dad smiling across the room, and went on my way. Later that evening, I realized I had not given that child the time I would have liked and hoped that she and her dad would not have yet traveled and be around when I got back to the center the next morning. As I arrived and parked my car, there were two people sitting on a bench outside in the parking lot. It was dad and Irene. And by the way, any names I use are changed. What I wanna ask when I realized they were sitting there waiting for me, maybe there were a thousand people the day before was, do you believe in divine providence? I approached them and we asked questions. What is your name? What's your age? Little Irene was three. There was enough conversation that dad was marveling at how Irene through the trip had never cried. He noted the night in the refrigerator. That's what people call the detention center because it's so cold. The first night that they slept there and Irene looked around and said to dad, is this where we're going to sleep? That's where they were going to sleep. 
his comment was, there were still no tears. We finished our conversation and I turned to go. There was a little piece of cement that I often tripped on in that little spot of the parking lot. I had learned to be careful of it. I had already tripped on it walking over to them and kind of chuckled. And as I turned, the same little spot caught me. I exclaimed and chuckled again and walked away. I turned to see dad throwing something off to the side. Yes, he had lifted the offending tripper, just picked it up and threw it aside for me. You and I could not have done that. Now I finally took a moment to ask dad his name. And he said, Oscar Romero. I think we all know about St. Oscar Romero. I was in too much amazement. I tried to continue inside and turned to comment one more time to Irene and Oscar and they were gone, gone. I believe I met two angels on that morning of February 28th, 2019. And also most likely it would be impossible for me to forget that beautiful encounter. So I give it to you to treasure with me. It sounds to me as I listen to that story, Sister Anne, that you must have had lots of encounters um, with lots of different people as there, you said there were three or six or a thousand folks coming through there in a day. Uh, after having worked with so many people and worked with immigrant communities, um, tell us, what are your feelings towards people now who have had to leave their home countries? Myriad and multitude, as I mentioned, referred to earlier. I keep a, uh, I keep a paper that's pretty um, old looking now on my refrigerator. It's been on my refrigerator for years. It's, I think it's out of a Marinol magazine. It, there's a picture on it. And there's a quote which says, no one would exchange his or her country for a foreign land if his or her own afforded the means of living a decent and happy, safe life. That says a lot to us. Who would leave everything and especially everyone and travel with one bag that you know you'll lose on the way? Only by our birth rate, each of us are not walking that way. We have one of our um, Honduran sisters also talks to us frequently now about what it's like to be there in Honduras and watch as more and more people head this way. What it's like being in that country. That also gives me a lot of food for thought. There's one other family that I think of all the time and it also helps me to name my feelings toward migrants. I'll call him Jose, but Jose came with his wife and six-year-old about two years ago when COVID was rampant in the Rio Grande Valley. And so they landed in the COVID hotel. She went to the hospital to have a new baby, brought the baby back to the hotel and she went back to the hospital with COVID and died. Leaving Jose with a new baby citizen and his six-year-old, brokenhearted. They didn't have any idea that that would happen when they were leaving their home country. It's people like them, while immigrants are often villainized here in this country, we want to remember people like them. There's a reason why they leave and why they come looking for better for their families. Well, and I think it's interesting as I hear you talk today, um, you've used the word safe and safety a few times. Um, you've mentioned how people are leaving their home countries because they don't feel safe there. Uh, you mentioned how there was quiet in uh, the center and you attributed that to people feeling safe. Uh, you know, the baby's not crying. And then also kind of the commenting on, you know, immigrants being villainized here in the United States. And there's, I always have this sense from people that they feel like immigrants 
who are coming here are going to make us unsafe in our country. Um, and it just seems kind of ironic to me that people who are um, leaving a place where they are unsafe to go to another place where they hope that they will be safe, that they will be seen as a threat. Um, and, uh, and I, you know, as you talk about um, Oscar and Irene and the other family that um, they don't really seem to, pr to pose a, a, a safety issue for us or a threat to us. Um, they're just kind of people like us who are looking to be in a place where they can be comfortable and make a living. Would you agree? Absolutely. And um, Mike, that brings to mind for me a, a picture that I've looked at a lot that has a line of policemen uh, in front of whom are is standing one child, the back of one child. That picture has always grabbed my attention and it's from the experience of all of the small children who I experienced being carried by their parents or walking beside their parents. What danger is that child presenting to all of us Yeah, that's uh, really a um, a striking image. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing it with me and with everyone watching. <laughs> so you are not at the border anymore after you're spending your six years there. You have left and you're doing other work now. How does your time at the border engage, uh, inform the work you're engaged in now? You know, um, I'm trying to keep my finger in. I want very much to keep my finger in with the immigration work, which presents itself here in Philadelphia. Philadelphia is one of the cities where uh, the Texas local government has begun to send buses. It's an opportunity to meet migrants here. Um, there are many ways, as we said, the borders in every city. So there are many ways to uh, keep aware of immigration and stay in the work. But interestingly, what I want to share with you, everyone listening, is I'm devoting a lot of my time to our Mercy Work, Mercy Focus on Haiti. And one thing is I say to myself, what in the world am I doing? Because I'm doing development work for our wonderful Mercy Work why am I doing development work? And that takes me back to Catherine McCauley and the Miranol sisters philosophy, not deciding what we do when we come to a new time, but listening to the spirit and what is needed. And so as I've spent this year and a half or so working with uh, development with Mercy Focus on Haiti, I've come to a sense that uh, I love and want to share with everyone listening, if our work for this Mercy Work, Mercy Focus on Haiti, empowers some Haitians, Haitian families, to remain at home and not come to our southern border, then we are doing even more than we hoped to do. Our Haitian migrants are among our worst treated immigrants. And that's because of racism in this country. That's because of the color of their skin. Thanks for that. Thanks for your border work. And thanks for um, continuing that in your in your work with Mercy Focus on Haiti. So now that you've been away from the border for some number of months, what is it about immigration and border issues that you think is most important for people, especially U.S. citizens, uh, to understand? That's going to take me to Harlingen, Texas. Harlingen is another big city in Texas. It's where the federal building is for immigration and naturalization service. I needed to take people there often. People that ran into a difficulty with uh, a court date that they were not going to be able to keep. They were still in Texas. They needed to get to New York to keep the court date and things that came along 
prevented them from getting there in time. There were many reasons that people needed to get to the INS building and uh, get some help with documents scheduling. So we made that trip often. <clears throat> and one time while I was sitting there waiting with someone, I got my awareness working. That's what we wanna ask of everybody. I noticed a great big poster up in the front of the huge auditorium we were sitting in. And it was a picture of the lady holding her lamp high. The picture that's labeled, give me your tired, huddled masses, yearning to breathe free, our Statue of Liberty. And I was so taken by, first of all, how long it took me to notice it, but noticing it and the dichotomy of who I was with mostly being treated like a number, the help they needed from us, and what we say we offer to people. All those mercy people across the country who were asking me, what, what could they do about the mess that we have at the border? And people still ask me that question, and sometimes that question is founded on politics, but often it is, in fact, based on humanity what we can do about the mess at the border. And actually in thinking about this time together today, I was thinking of the sentence, what do I choose? I choose the works of mercy that we all deserve, that Jesus teaches us, and that we want to offer to all of our brothers and sisters looking for life as good as we know it. Before we close, um, there was a, a prayer that you had that you um, wanted to share um, before our closing today um, about uh, refugees. Um, so we're going to put that up on the screen and I'll invite you um, to read that before I do our closing. Okay, and I'd be really happy to do that because I'd love to leave us all with these words for the sake of those thousands and thousands of people from all over the world. It's a global situation now. It's no longer Central and or South America that we're focusing on. And so we say together, so I have a new name, refugee. Strange that a name should take away from me my past, my personality, my hope. Strange refuge this. So many seem to share this name, refugee, yet we share so many differences. I find no comfort in my new name. I long to share my past, restore my pride, to show I too, in time, will offer more than I have borrowed. For now, the comfort that I seek resides in the old yet new name I would choose, friend. Well, thank you for that and for all of your stories today, Sister Anne. Um, I appreciate you sharing them with me and with our audience and the time we spent working to, to prepare and, and get ready for this. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Andrew, who is our, is our communications person, who's doing a lot of the behind the, the scenes work for us. It certainly is. Yeah. Um, so, and, and he knows a lot of stuff we don't know. So that's Absolutely. a good thing. Um, Mike, I for, want to thank you for a quick minute. And I want everybody to hear me thank you. Um, your own uh, care and deep interest, um, it's more than interest, uh, for the people that the population that we're talking about has been so evident to me through our preparation. Um, it's a joy and a, I'm just really proud that you're part of our uh, advocacy group. Well, it's been uh, my privilege to do this work with you. Um, and I also want to say to our audience, um, if, if you heard what you heard today inspires you to walk with immigrants, uh, we invite you to please join the Sisters of Mercy in advocacy on behalf of migrants. Uh, by going to the address at the bottom of our screen, you can sign up to receive action alerts on immigration and other critical issues. And then we'll also say, um, lastly, uh, stay tuned for upcoming episodes of Mercy Walks with Migrants. 
we have a lot more immigration stories to share. Uh, thank you for joining us. Have a great day and walk with mercy. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Sister Ann.